Okay, everyone. So welcome to Dementia Talks, an educational talk series on dementia and caregiving for the Alzheimer's Awareness Month. My name is Herman Chica Alfonso, and I'm the Education and Program Coordinator for the Dementia Society. We recognize the importance of aphasia and dementia. That's why we are pleased to introduce our speaker today. She's Joanne Winkel. She's a speech language pathologist and director of education and collaborative network at the Aphasia Center of Ottawa. So welcome, Joanne, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. All right. So um, good afternoon, everybody. You may recognize this young woman. Uh, if you watched Joe Biden's inauguration last week, uh, she's the young poet, Amanda Gorman. Uh, and she uh, shared at the ceremony a uh, poem that she'd written, a very inspiring and uh, powerful uh, poem um, titled The Hill We Climb. I'd like to share another uh, part of a poem from you, some other poetry. Uh, this is... Um, uh, poetry from a woman named uh, Maisel Smith. Uh, Maisel Smith um, uh, had uh, brain surgery in 1999 due to uh, a meningioma, which is a type of brain tumor, uh, and lived um, her life afterwards with aphasia. Uh, and she writes, when I stumble, gentle are the hands that hold me, my voice, my voice, you are my voice when words evaporate. And um, I find that it's quite powerful. The idea of words evaporating is how she described her experience with aphasia. Uh, and it's also important that she uh, is um, indicating that uh, she appreciates support. So she talks about the hands that hold me, you are my voice. And we'll be talking about these things uh, today. What happens when uh, people are having trouble with their words and what support can we give them? So let's start talking a little bit about some communication problems. I want to compare and contrast three different things. Uh, aphasia due to stroke, dementia, and primary progressive aphasia. Uh, which is often called PPA because it's uh, so such a long uh, name as most uh, many disorders are uh, in medicine. Um, and I want to mention that um, I will be uh, trying to keeping try to keep things to um, uh, simplest elements, and therefore I may be leaving a lot of things out. There's often exceptions to the rules, and uh, so uh, my apologies if I have. Um, uh, taken a lot of the detail out of things, uh, but I hope it will make it easier for people to understand. Also, there are discoveries that happen, uh, you know, uh, every year uh, in uh, healthcare, and so things I may tell you today uh, may not be quite true in five years from now. Uh, so just bear that in mind. So let's look first, what is aphasia? Aphasia is not a common term. Most people have never heard of aphasia before. Uh, but it's an acquired language disorder. So acquired, in other words, you're not born with it. Uh, it happens later due to uh, either a brain injury or brain disease. Uh, and the most common is a stroke. Uh, so that would be either a blood clot or a hemorrhage to a cerebral artery uh, in the brain. Typically with aphasia due to stroke, memory and reasoning are relatively intact. They may not be 100% perfect, but basically the big problem is language. So what is what am I talking about when I'm talking about language exactly? So there are four different aspects, or we call them modalities to language. Uh, they are talking, so finding the words you wanna say and being able to say the right words, reading, writing, and in that, I'm going to include typing, because whether you're writing by hand or whether you're typing, you are going to be, um, you know, trying to find the words you want, the right spelling, the right grammar. And uh, so that uh, aspect of language can be affected, you know, whether you're writing or typing. 
and understanding what others say. And by that, I'm not talking about hearing. I'm not talking about a hearing loss. Someone with aphasia may hear perfectly what someone says to them, but they may not quite catch the meaning of it. And this can also happen in aphasia, where someone has in their mind very clearly what they want to express, but a different word might come out. Uh, so they may be thinking chair, but the word table might come out. They're not confused. They know what a chair is. They know where they bought the chair, what color the chair is, uh, uh, et cetera, everything about the chair, but a different word might come out. Sometimes people are aware that this has happened and sometimes they're unaware. Now let's look at dementia. It's an impairment of memory and at least one other uh, cognitive domain. So maybe memory and language, memory and personality uh, problems, memory and executive function. Executive function is things like um, planning things or getting things started. And it represents a decline from a previous level of functioning. So it's something that's getting uh, worse and it becomes severe enough to cause problems in your daily life. Dementia is an umbrella term. There are many different types of dementia. Uh, here are a few to give you some examples. There's Alzheimer's dementia, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, and there are others. Now, the third one I want to, uh, um, to explain to you is primary progressive aphasia or PPA. Uh, what is that? So you have the word aphasia in it. And so therefore it's a language problem and it can affect any of those four modalities that I mentioned before, talking, reading, writing, understanding what people say. Uh, but unlike a stroke, which is a stroke is very sudden, uh, and, um, but primary progressive aphasia is a slowly progressive disorder. It starts off with maybe mild changes and find, having trouble finding your words, and it can get worse over time. And it's caused by a neurodegenerative disease, a disease that is uh, affecting the brain. Uh, and the, as that disease progresses, uh, the symptoms uh, can get worse. To be called primary progressive aphasia, an important thing is that what stands out the most would be communication, would be speech and language. It should be the, the thing that really stands out, the biggest problem, uh, at least at the beginning, that these people are having. So um, if I kind of just back up and let's just look at those three again, I'm going to leave a lot of the detail out and just go to the core of the, the problems. With aphasia due to stroke, you're looking at language problems, those four areas of language. Dementia is a memory disorder. That's kind of the most important feature. Um, and primary progressive aphasia is language. That's the problems with language are what stand out. But in primary progressive aphasia, um, the... Uh, those problems are being caused by an underlying disease. And so therefore, over time, signs and symptoms of that underlying disease uh, will typically start to show themselves. Let's look at some everyday examples uh, to maybe help you understand what this means. Let's take walking in your neighborhood. If someone has aphasia due to a stroke, if they're walking in their neighborhood, they may have trouble reading the street signs. Uh, they may see a neighbor that they know, but have trouble um, finding their name, accessing their name uh, and saying their name, but they're gonna know that neighborhood well. They're going to really um, have no problem going around if they've been living there for a long time and they're not going to get lost or disoriented. Let's say you have a person with Alzheimer's disease, a form of dementia, and they're walking in their neighborhood. If the disease has progressed far enough, they might be able to, they may have trouble uh, being disoriented, but they might be able to read the street signs, okay? If you have someone with primary progressive aphasia walking in their neighborhood, at first, they may have similar problems to the person who has aphasia due to stroke, 
uh, being able to find the name of the of the neighbor, being able to uh, read the signs of the street signs. Uh, but what will happen over time is depending on what underlying disease is causing this primary progressive aphasia, they may over time start to have difficulties with becoming disoriented in that neighborhood. Let's look at another example. What did you have for breakfast? Aphasia due to stroke? They know exactly, let's say, what did you have for breakfast? And we're asking you now, like around lunchtime. So like a few hours have passed. Um, someone who has aphasia due to stroke, they'll know exactly what they had for breakfast, but they may not be able to say the word raspberry. They may not be able to find that word, even though they can imagine the raspberry in their mind. A person with Alzheimer's, if the Alzheimer's disease is advanced enough, at lunchtime, they may not be able to tell you what they had for breakfast because they don't remember. And if you ask someone with primary progressive aphasia what they had for breakfast, at first, they may struggle to um, find the words for what they had for breakfast, but they know what they had for breakfast. But over time, as that underlying disease progresses, they may not remember what they had for breakfast. Okay, so now you have a bit of an idea uh, about aphasia and about primary progressive aphasia. And at the Ottawa, at the Aphasia Center of Ottawa, uh, we uh, accept uh, people both uh, who have aphasia due to stroke and who have um, primary progressive aphasia um, or an aphasia uh, caused by some underlying uh, disease. And so I'd like to talk to you about our programs and services. Uh, this is what our front door uh, looks like, uh, even though the building is not as full as it used to be. And I want to talk to you a bit about what did we offer before the pandemic struck? What are we currently offering in terms of programs and services? And what do we hope to offer after the pandemic? So before the pandemic, um, people would come into the center. We're located at 2081 Maryvale Road. Uh, and uh, people would walk in and have their all their programs there. Uh, we're community-based, uh, so we're not associated directly with a hospital or a, or a university. We're in the community. We're a not-for-profit and a registered charity, and we've existed since 1990. Uh, here's a picture of our staff. Our staff are grouped uh, primarily in three uh, different professions. So we have speech language pathologists like myself, we have social workers, and we have uh, communication disorders assistants. Um, and we call them CDAs uh, for short. How do people come to the Aphasia Center of Ottawa? Uh, well, people can go online and uh, to uh, check out our website and you can uh, just Google uh, Aphasia Center of Ottawa and you'll uh, see it there. And on the website, uh, there's an area where you can get a referral form. Um, most of our referrals come from either uh, speech language pathologists um, when it comes to stroke. Uh, they're often neurologists uh, and uh, uh, physicians from the uh, uh, either neurologists in the community or physicians from uh, the Briere Memory Disorders Clinic, uh, but they can be other health professionals as well. Uh, and you can uh, apply to us uh, yourself. We will obviously ask you questions if you haven't been uh, referred by a health professional, but uh, it is possible to do that. One of our social workers takes that referral form. They will phone uh, the family and organize in the old days before the pandemic, a home visit. So the social worker would actually go into your house, um, uh, which was a, uh, you know, a very nice way to actually meet people in person. Uh, and then after that, we would invite you to come and tour the aphasia center, come to Maryvale Road. The types of referral fall uh, referrals fall mainly into two categories. We have people who have aphasia due to a stroke and we have uh, people um, with aphasia who have not had a stroke. Most of those people have primary progressive aphasia, but often people come to us and they may not have a diagnosis yet. Uh, you know, neurologists have to meet certain criteria before they can give a diagnosis. 
uh, and, but they may feel the person is appropriate for the aphasia center and, and refer them. So we call this non-stroke aphasia uh, because we, um, uh, as I say, people may not have a diagnosis when they first come. Um, and we have two streams uh, for these because the needs of people who are recovering from stroke and the needs of people who have a neurodegenerative disease can be quite different and the needs of their families as well. And so uh, we have two streams uh, two separate uh, programs with different services in each. Um, over time, the amount of uh, people in the non-stroke program have, um, has increased a, a lot. If you look back to two, year 2000, maybe less than 5% of our referrals were for people who had not had a stroke. And then you see 2013, about 16%, 2016, 32%. Uh, and so we've had an increase. Uh, we believe that this increase is due to the fact that uh, health professionals are more aware um, of our services and uh, are referring more. So before the pandemic, uh, the social worker would visit, uh, you'd come and tour the center. Uh, and then when we had enough people to create what we call a transition group, we would have four sessions of that before you would access other programs. Um, so what is a transition group? So in it, you have uh, a speech language pathologist like myself, uh, one of our social workers, and then you would have some pairs of people, maybe uh, one, like maybe two or three or even four pairs of people. Often these are married couples. So the person with aphasia and their spouse, but it could be the person with aphasia and their sister, or the person with aphasia and their adult son. So uh, basically a person with aphasia and a family member. Why do we do the transition groups? Well, we wanna answer questions that you have and we want to identify who might benefit from a little extra something, maybe some extra counseling. We, ha we have counseling um, uh, built into these programs uh, that we offer, but sometimes people need uh, uh, something a bit more or a bit more help with communication strategies. And we want to identify which of our different programs is going to be best for the person with aphasia and for um, the family member. So we do a lot of group work. Uh, we um, really find that this approach is most beneficial uh, for most people, both in the uh, stroke stream and the non-stroke stream. So we have a staff person who leads the group. Um, we have some, you know, pre-pandemic, we had volunteers helping us sometimes, but they were not leading groups. All groups are led by staff, usually by communication, uh, communicative disorders assistants, our CDAs. And then there would be, uh, as you can see, we have round tables. You can see two people with aphasia there, but uh, usually in a group, there's three to six people, often uh, four or five. Um, and we take an approach of um, embedding our techniques in a natural conversation. Uh, what we're doing is we're helping through the use, the facilitator uses uh, techniques to um, uh, help the person to communicate and encourage them to use strategies uh, in the group as well. Uh, sometimes they may learn strategies from someone else in the group. They'll see someone else doing something and they certainly get peer support uh, from being with other people who are uh, experiencing something um, for them, uh, like them. Uh, and social work uh, staff and speech pathology staff uh, can be involved um, when it's indicated. We also offer individual and counts family counseling when needed with a social worker. Um, and prior to the pandemic, we had activity groups. So people would be um, uh, sitting, working on something that they had chosen themselves, having help from a volunteer, but a staff would circulate and, and help out. We mostly do group work, uh, but occasionally we will do some individual speech language therapy, some one-to-one, -one, uh, and that's usually 
for a specific reason. Let's say um, someone has uh, really wants to work on their writing in a more intensive way, then uh, they might be um, appropriate for some individual work. Um, these are some people from the aphasia action group. These are um, stroke survivors with aphasia who want to help uh, educate people about what is aphasia. And so with this group, uh, the intent um, uh, was to be able to invite maybe a journalist or a politician and talk to them about aphasia and tell them how we could make our society more welcoming, more accessible for people with aphasia. Right next door to the Aphasia Centre of Ottawa, uh, in fact, you don't even have to go outside the building to get to it, is a private physiotherapy clinic called Action Potential Rehabilitation. Um, and many of our um, people with aphasia uh, would come to our programs and also access those services. Uh, you don't have to use that physiotherapy clinic if you already have uh, uh, physiotherapy services that you like, but it is uh, very uh, convenient and we partner with them. Uh, and they, um, the volunteers and students who uh, help out there all get uh, training on what is aphasia and some communication strategies uh, from us. We also offer, offer services en français. Uh, we have uh, two speech language pathologists and a social worker who are fluent in French, and therefore we can do uh, groups in French, uh, conversation groups in French, and counseling as needed. Next door, uh, the physiotherapists uh, there, some of them uh, speak French. Um, other services and partnerships, uh, we... Um, uh, Pre-pandemic, we had students uh, come and do clinical placements with us um, who were, um, say, in speech-language pathology, for example. We would give lots of uh, family and caregiver workshops. We'd do hands-on training uh, for health professionals, teaching them how to communicate well with um, patients with aphasia. And uh, we are not a research facility, but uh, we um, sometimes would partner with the university. So what are we offering right now in the pandemic? Right now, all of our services are virtual. In other words, they're on a computer. We're using a, a secure platform called OnCall Health that has been designed to use um, with health professionals to be able to protect private information. And we have had a situation where sometimes people um, may not have a computer uh, or they may not have, or maybe the computer's too old. And so uh, we have um, what we call an iPad lending library. We have some iPads that we can lend out to uh, someone if they don't have a, a device uh, for accessing our services. Um, so we have uh, the first six online sessions, um, those are funded by uh, the Ministry of Health through the Champlain uh, LIN or Local Health Integration Network. After that, uh, some of the programs and services have fees. We discuss all of this in the transition group, um, but uh, we never turn anyone away without service. So, you know, uh, for people who ha are, have financial difficulties, we can have a sliding scale, or if they really cannot afford anything at all, we will um, make some, some services uh, um, accessible to them anyway. We get about half of our funding from the Ministry of Health, uh, and the rest we, um, we raise ourselves through uh, uh, fundraising and other methods. What are we going to offer after the pandemic? Well, we're hoping to be able to offer um, in-person services when it's uh, safe to do so uh, at 2081 Maryvale, but we will continue on with virtual services uh, because some people can't really uh, attend uh, in person. 
Um, maybe they have health concerns that prevent them, or it might be the distance. So we have some people who have um, joined us uh, in our virtual services, some from Arnprior, some from Cornwall. Uh, I just got an inquiry from Hawkesbury. And so when we open up again, it might not be very convenient for those people to try and drive, you know, an hour or more to get to our center. So we want to maintain some virtual services uh, as well. Okay. So, you know, for more information uh, and uh, the Dementia Society can also uh, post uh, some of our information for you, of uh, those who have participated in the program. Uh, you can find a lot more uh, on our website or you can call us uh, at 567-1119. Uh, we still have people answering the phones, uh, even though um, people are not coming into the centre um, to participate. And uh, in terms of the physio next door, the action potential rehabilitation, uh, if you're interested in that, they, to my knowledge, are offering a, some in-service, uh, some in-house, um, in-person uh, physiotherapy in certain cases and in other cases it's online some virtual uh, physiotherapy uh, classes and their number is 613-680-6400. Uh,